when it's my time to transition. He said, Pop, it'll be like you walking through the woods and taking a step over the stream. He said, I can't bring you across, but the minute you step over, I'm there. Hello, passionate listeners and watchers. Welcome to Passion Harvest. I am Louisa, your host. Thank you so much for joining me wherever you are in the world right now. Our guest today is Joe McQuillan. After the death of his son, Joe McQuillan was led on a search to find his beloved son, Christopher. Joe did not accept a world devoid of his son, and he began to research the metaphysical and seek out answers to what happens next. He experienced profound communications with his son on the other side. That also helped him to understand what happens when we die. Joe is an author and public speaker. This is his story and this is his passion, Joe McQuillan. Welcome to Passion Harvest. I'm really excited to have you on the show today. Welcome. Thank you, Luis. I'm excited to be here myself. I've got an Australian girl living in Paris. Maybe we'll get the word out internationally. Yeah. <laughs> um, I well, I just, I just love your story and your experiences and well, with your son, Christopher, would you mind for those of the people that haven't read your books, sharing Christopher's transition and how the communication on the other side evolved with him? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so in January uh, 3rd, 2016, uh, it basically started on January 2nd when the boys, a group of kids, a dozen of them, they were high school friends. They were all college age. Chris was 21. Uh, we're wrapping up Christmas vacation before going back to college and went, we're, we're, went up to Wisconsin to a friend's parents' lake house, you know, just to kick up their heels the last day, celebrate, spend the night there, come home the next day, um, you know, shoot pool at a local pub. In which they did, and came back to uh, came back to the house where the party continued. And uh, uh, at three o'clock in the morning, Chris and uh, three friends uh, went outside, saw a boathouse. Um, it was a perfect storm—a snoot full of alcohol. You know, recklessness as every twenty-one-year-old boy can be, as I was at that age. Um, layered clothing, Timberland boots unlaced four boys in a three-man canoe, uh, partially frozen lake up in Wisconsin. They paddled out. None of them made it back. Um, I got a text at 11 o'clock. I was waiting for Christopher to come home to watch football with me before he went to school the next day. At 11 o'clock, I got a text that said, Mr. McHugh, Chris and three of his friends are missing. So I uh, jumped in the, grabbed my Labrador and jumped in the, uh, put on some boots and jumped in the Jeep and headed up north. And, uh, you know, I fully expected to find him in a, in a boathouse or a cottage with a pretty co-ed or a couple of guys with too much to drink. And, and instead, halfway up, I got a call from the uncle who lived in the same neighborhood. And he said, hey, Mr. McQuillan, I got some bad news. The, uh, it's no longer a search, but a recovery. All four boys had drowned. Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I had to finish the drive up and, you know, you go a little, you go a little black, you know, you're kind of in a, in shock and finish the drive up there. And uh, man, to this moment, Louise, I, I'm looking out my window in my office. This was Christopher's bedroom and it's my office. And I can see myself standing at the front doorway, looking out the picture window to the lake and seeing the emergency lights and the boats and the divers and the police and the sheriff and, and, uh, in Wisconsin, you don't identify the body, which, you know, I, I'm a pretty stubborn guy, but even I didn't have the will to even fight it. You know, they had you identify a, a picture. There was no chance of me getting to see my voice, but they showed me a picture. And it was him, um, but not him. You know, uh, he was, uh, he had the Celtic cross like his old man. He had, uh, he had a uh, minor league baseball jacket that was mine, you know, um, you know, it was, it was him. And, uh, you know, it takes a few days to get the bodies because um, you're going from state to state from Wisconsin, to Illinois. 
um, to get the bodies uh, released, you know, and uh, so there were a lot of details, you know, uh, I would have loved to have just fold it up in a little ball, uh, which I do occasionally and, and, and cry, but I, I had to get things handled and uh, I just got to figure out how to connect. And if it's all hokey new age BS, let's cross it off the list, right? I mean, I didn't walk in here with a background in, in the metaphysical. It's not that I didn't believe, I just, it wasn't part of my repertoire. I didn't, it wasn't in my life. But now I thought, okay, here's a possibility. You know, here's, I always look in those situations for what I can do to improve the situation. And in my life, what can I do? do to, to stay connected to this boy that I adore so much. And that started my search, you know, so I started reading all kinds of uh, sending lectures, uh, spirit groups, going to mediums, uh, anything that would put me in touch with my boy. And the culmination is, is the relationship we have now. And two wonderful books that I think, and I say that in all humility, because, you know, I was, I was kind of the I was kind of the channel, right? Chris was the messenger. And so two amazing books of, of how to connect and actually, you know, how to find a path to survive after the loss of, uh, of a child or even loved one. I'm a little arrogant in my thoughts that only somebody who loses a child has the depth of loss that I have, you know, but well, there's some significant losses that aren't children, but you know, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of helping parents find a way to, to open that door. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yes, I, I mean, I can't yeah. even imagine losing a child. It's just... No. I don't want you to. <laughs> I don't want anybody to. And people say to me, what's the message that you want parents to grasp after a conversation or reading the books or attending a lecture? And I tell them, that I want them to know that their kids are still right here. You know, now you might have to do a little work to be able to connect. So, you know, go do it, go to it, figure it out, learn, ask, reach out, contact me, you know, um, anything that you can do to improve the odds of connecting with your kid, you should do. And I'm sure this search for your boy that, you know, you'd never give up. That must have in some way alleviated, if that's the right word, the grief. That you well, have. it channels the grief. It gives you a purpose for one. And part of the thing that I had to figure out, I'm, I'm, I'm a nuts and bolts guy, right? Look at me. I got a crew cut. My nose is <laughs> bent. I just stopped <laughs> playing hockey two years ago at 60. I'm 65 now. I gave I gave him up at 63 with a had to replace a hip <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> But I'm sitting here with candles and I've, 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 I've lit, I had burned sage and I have uh, uh, crystals and I don't look like the kind of guy that would do that. And I do all of that because it connects me. It gives me an edge to connect. You know, I've always been a guy looking for the edge, you know, and, and, and this advantage, you know, is, is what you do if you want to connect. You can sit back in your chair and whine that you haven't connected with your loved one, your child. Or you could do a little work and figure it out and I'll help you. I'd love to talk in a moment just about your the beginnings and your evolution of the communication with Christopher. But for those that are listening that are grieving or in the depths of grief from a loved one, does does it get easier? No. No. You get okay. tools. Now, I, I would say in this, you know, the impact that you felt when you get the first news is, is a gut punch, right? I mean, it's, it's a tsunami. It, it takes you. Um, you acquired tools to handle the grief. Listen, I'm not some mopey guy. I live my life beyond my wildest dreams. I have my wonderful son on the other side. I have two kids and adult kids on this side that I adore. My beautiful wife, who's a therapist, who's we're talking to her editor right now about her first book. Um, she's brilliant and lovely. And we've been married 30 years and survived the loss of our son and marriage intact, which is about a 25% a average, you know? Um, now my heart's never going to be healed until I cross and see Chris again, but I can have this amazing, full, loving service oriented life 
you know, with a piece of a broken piece of my heart on the other side. So if anybody's looking for this to heal, you know, bad news, guys, it's not. Um, you know, you're going to figure out a way to work around the grief, work through the grief, embrace the grief. You know, I to this, look at me, six and a half years later, I'm talking to you and I'm crying, you know, and I'm a tough guy, Louisa, <laughs> you know, and, and and which is one of the reasons I don't care about crying, you know, because mm -hmm. I don't care. Um, you know, but but, you know, anybody who said time heals all wounds, never lost a kid. A part of you is always going to be on the other side, you know, but I do know, you know, I'm 65 and I'm, you know, pretty healthy, I play a lot of golf. I, I love my life and um, I'm not looking to go anywhere anytime soon, but I am round and third. And so there's some comfort in knowing that it won't be that long before I'm united with my kid again, my son, Chris, on the other side. And he tells me we talk about that all the time. You know, he gave me the title last night, or this morning at three o'clock in the morning, I had a session with him and I'll explain that to you. But he gave me the title to the third book I'm, book I'm working at. And, and he said, uh, he said, I'm proud of you, Pop. You know, you're handling it well with one foot in both worlds. And he said, maybe that's a title to a book. You know, uh, uh, you know, so a, a foot in both worlds is, is probably the title of book three that I'm working at, you know, so I connect with him all the time. I know when he's around, um, I feel him. I feel him in thin places. I feel him in special places. I feel him when I'm golfing, you know, I call on him and I know when he's there, I get a tingle in the back of my neck. I got it now he's here. So how did the, the, the communication or you recognizing and trusting the communication how did that start and evolve great question because there, there are two steps there's recognizing and then believing and then knowing right so every in in anybody's anybody's journey who who's connected with the other side or is involved pretty often that that, that part of your life is part of the other side there was an aha moment when it breaks, when it hit. So, so I decided to go see this guy. I wanted to see a medium in person. I wanted to see a guy or a gal looking at me. I wanted to look at him while he looked at my son. So I booked this, this medium. It was before COVID, obviously. You know, this was in June 30th of 2016. So six months after Chris transition. Now, two things I did before I met with Andrew Anderson. One is I went into my dresser and pulled out this bracelet that I wear now all the time. It's, Chris gave it to me when we were in Disney World when he was four or five. It says, Dad, has Goofy on it, which is no surprise, you know. <clears throat> and so I grabbed that, put it on under my cuff, and I had just received some shamrock. And uh, so I, I was going there that day to plant some shamrock seeds around the loose dirt because this is they had reinterred them a couple of days before. and. Uh, so I went there and, uh, and, and, and planted those shamrock seeds. Then I went out to uh, Hoffman Estates, which is a suburb, west suburb, and, and saw Andrew. I went into his office, and it was typical medium office with, you know, with big crystals and, and posters and stars. And, and it was you know, very soothing and nice. And, and I went in, and he described Chris. He wanted to see a picture. He described Chris as as being fun loving and kind of a party boy, but there was a dark side. You know, we were worried about his, you know, alcohol use. And we were worried about depression when that would kick in. And, <clears throat> you know, even though the whole world, he was the most phone loving kid in the world, you know, and, um, but we knew there was that side that scared Sally and I. So we identified that. He said, your family was on the other side. Now remember, Andrew didn't know anything but my first name. He said, your family's on the other side. They celebrated something for you yesterday. What was that? And it was Sally and my anniversary, wedding anniversary. And he said, you know, your whole family came together. And he said, Chris is acknowledging that you're wearing a bracelet he gave you. And Chris is acknowledging you were at his grave very recently planting something. What was that? Louisa, that's the moment I went from believing to knowing. There was no doubt that that's that's. That's when the doors just sprung open. This guy didn't know me from Adam. My, the, I, the bracelet was under a cuff. You're not going to see anything. Nobody knew. I didn't even tell my wife about planting the shamrocks. 
the shamrock still come up to this day um not because i was hiding shamrocks it just it wasn't that big a deal i got them the night before i she was still asleep when i left the house and i planted them you know but those instances have continued to follow me for the six and a half years of since chris's transition so that's when i went very much from believing to knowing went to a bunch of medium sessions i <laughs> first started taking notes and, and and then started recording them and uh and and they all give you permission to record them it's not you know and if medium doesn't want you to record this session get another medium you know um and so i was putting this all in a in a in a file just a just a legal file according to date so that one day i'd be sitting on a rocking chair on a patio or a porch and smoking a cigar and reading these these notes so i started getting to uh, uh, started going into this my office here. I started waking up around three a.m. and I actually thought it was because that's when I know when Chris transitioned. It would be it was between three and four. So I started uh, uh, getting up, coming in here, and I would align my chakras, light sage candles, have crystals, hold them. I have some sand from Siesta Key. We go there every year, and it's quartz crystal, not sand. And I thought that was urban legend until I looked it up. And uh, so I do all the things like a ritual, and 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 I would feel them around, and I'd love it. And on the anniversary's crossing, I was sitting here just like I'm sitting here now. Went through my routine, and I'd listen to a guided meditation. Uh, and I random, I did it last night or this morning at three a.m. And I would write down or i would i would you know absolve absorb what, what they were doing and i loved it and so i'd start to meditate and then i'd get up and go to bed well on january 3rd three o'clock in the morning 2017 so it's one year after christopher's transition i came in here went through my whole routine and started getting feedback i picked up a pen and on a legal pad just started writing what he was telling me and basically he was describing uh, heaven and other things and sorry about what happened and uh, the pain that he caused you know he told me that despite what mediums say he does miss parts of of our world he misses me he misses his jeep he told me he misses his dog and mom and you know and 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 i've been told by mediums because the world is so amazing over there that they really don't miss us and they're around us but he said you know that's not true there are things i miss and uh and then he said to me, uh, and he described, he said, the colors are amazing. He said, they were frigging amazing, which is a term my old man used to use. He said, uh, they're blues and greens and, and, and air is always warm. So it's like love and air combined, it's called love air. And then he said, <clears throat> this is how I knew this wasn't me putting a salve on my broken heart. He said, you gotta let go of the resentment with Scotty. I love Scotty. He loved me. We were pals. It wasn't his fault. And what that was is I was still carrying on a resentment for the family who owned the lake house. You know, how do you let 12 knuckleheaded kids, you know, hoop it up, do whatever they want. You know, and the truth of the matter is that was just me being resentful, right? It could have been my house, could have been anywhere. Um, but I was mad at the family and I was mad at the kid. And so I shot, sure, Chris, I can let go of this resentment, you know, besides when will I ever see Scotty again, right? You know, well, flash forward 12 hours, I get a text from some of his college buddies who are still in our lives. They're like family to us now. We go to their weddings, their parties. They hold an anniversary party, a birthday party for Chris every year. Um, I have a golf outing they all attend. They join us at the grave on January 3rd. I mean, these kids, I can't believe how wonderful they are and what a void they filled in my life. Um, and, and so uh, I got a text that said, Mr. McHugh, we're going to meet at the grave at 3.30. Can you join us? And, and, and so it was the anniversary, so I wasn't working that day. Shelly and I were going to go around dusk and light a Chinese lantern. And that was my plan. You know, the Greeks always say that man plans and gods laugh, you know. So I said, sure. You know, I, I threw a hockey cooler in the, in the in the back with some gatorade and some beer and grabbed a box of cigars and figured me and five six guys would reminisce and and support each other well i get out there and the, the the park lot's full and there were 40 kids at his grave you know from high school to grammar school to college 
all of them there just to be with their friend. And on a cold January 3rd and you know, outside of Chicago, it's not a warm, beautiful time. And one of the first kids I walked into was Scotty. And I was able to embrace him and say, hey, buddy, Chris loved you. I love you. It wasn't your fault, you know. Now, that wasn't my thought. My thought was hold on to the resentment. You got to blame somebody, right? But Chris wanted me to evolve, and he prepared me for that moment. So that's why I knew it wasn't me making up something that's going to make me feel better about this horrible tragedy, you know? God doesn't wind us up like little tin soldiers on a, on a pre-planned route. You know, we have free will. I believe we have soul contracts. I believe we have exit points. But I also believe we have free will. And Chris's recklessness and free will caused him to transition early. Um, and I know that God was the reason I was able to function after, after Christopher had made that transition. And I know that God and Christopher are the reason that I can supply support to other parents that just don't know the path. You know, these guys gave me this great gift of, of connecting, you know, but I have a responsibility. You got to give it away to keep it. If I hoard this like King Midas his treasure, I might lose it. And I'm not going to risk that. You know, I'm, I'm a different guy than I was before January 3rd, 2016. Sure, and it's it's amazing how you've recycled this experience <laughs> to help yourself and to help others. I'd like to ask you about what how Christopher Christopher describes what happened to him. What is heaven or the afterlife like? Well, he described what happened. A couple of things. One is, and this is through a combination of his meeting with his connecting with me, and by the way, <laughs> six years later, six and a half years later, at least twice a month. We, we do this three o'clock session where I wake up, bang, come in, do it. I did it three o'clock this morning and I have it. And Chris described, here's a great way that he describes the other afterlife. He said to me, dad, your side, your side is fine. He said, it's like football camp. And I played ball when I was a kid. He said, you're with your friends. It's a lot of hard work. There's a lot of fun. You know, there's, there's work, there's pain, there's sweat, there's competition. He said, that's your side. He said, my side is like a beach bungalow in Maui. He said, your guy's okay, dad. Mine's better, <laughs> you know? And he's told me, how about this? He told me when it's my time to transition, he said, pop, it'll be like you walking through the woods and taking a step over the stream. He said, I can't bring you across, but the minute you step over, I'm there. You'll never be alone. And he said, look, he said, I was shocked. He said, there was a learning curve involved because I didn't know what to expect. He said, you're going to know every step but because of the way we've been talking about it. None of this will be a surprise to you. Your transition is going to be easy. And he said, and every, we're all going to be there. He said, you know, my sister, Jerry, Billy, Bobby, Pat, Marsha, Carrie. He said, they're all here. And when you come, the circle will be complete. Why do you think we come into physical form in our humanness? What is our purpose? Earth Why? school. Oh. Earth school. We're here to learn. We're here to evolve. It's all about connecting. It's all about soul. It's all about spirit. It's, I got to tell you, it's tough to hear from a guy like me, but it's all about love, man. It's all about kindness, you know? You know, that's, that really is it. You know, Rumi, I love it when people talk about this as new age, newfangled, new age. Rumi was a poet in the 12th century. And, 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 and Rumi said that goodbyes are for those who love with their eyes. For those who love with their heart and soul, there's no such thing as separation. You know, so this learning has been going on since, since we set foot. And this isn't it. This isn't our last go round. I was funny because not knowing anything, I was worried about... Chris coming back and me leave, you know, leaving this earth and passing on the, on the uh, metaphysical superhighway, you know, and I got some messages that that's not how it works. The son, the spirit, Chris McQuillan, my son will always be on the other side, even though a different spirit from the same soul of Christopher McQuillan might be here raising a family because he wanted to be a dad. And he told me one of his few regrets was not being a father. So he, and he was like a magnet. Kids, kids followed him around like a, 
you know, like the Pied Piper. And I know one of he's told me one of his jobs over there is helping kids who transitioned, who are scared and fearful. And that's kind of kid he was, you know, Louisa, there were 2000 people at his wake, 2000 in the, you know, winty, winter, cold, rainy uh, night. And uh, one of the hardest moments of my life was leaving him there in that uh, funeral home. <laughs> the funeral director, excuse me, was amazing. She, she kept the, the, kept the, the uh, funeral home open two extra hours so everybody could come through. And then she let me sit there as long as I wanted. But I've learned a lot since then. And I know that he's not alone. And I know he's not cold. And I know he's with me all the time. And he's pushing me to be a better guy. You know, there's a, you, you'd never think a guy like me would quote uh, Amuki Murakami and say, once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. That's what storms are all about. And I'm not the same person I was prior to that. I live my life two ways right now, Louisa. To please my God, make my son proud. And if I base every decision on those two tenets, I can't go wrong. Yeah. God, I should have brought my tissue box. <laughs> oh, I just, I, Good thing you can edit it. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going to keep it. I just love your openness and, and, and vulnerability. And I, I just want to thank you so much for sharing for the audience that want to connect with children or loved ones connect with the non-physical what are your tools or tips to do this okay so on my on my website um joemcquillen.net is tools for connecting and it's steps and it tells and basically this is what i do it doesn't mean this is what you're everybody but this works for me all i can share is my experience strength and hope right and so I have tools for connecting about what I do at three o'clock in the morning, you know, and, and, and I remember I said, I thought it was because that's when he transitioned, but it wasn't, you know, between three and four is the bewitching hour when spirits are very active. So, you know, I hear from a lot of parents that that three o'clock hour is pretty magic, you know? So if it involves getting, you know, getting up, I get woken up. I just get flat out woken up. And, and sometimes I don't make the bell cause I'm exhausted. And Crystal let me off the hook. You know, he'll say to me, you know, Pop, time is your side. We don't have time. It's cool. You know, tomorrow is good as today, whatever that means. It doesn't work like that for us. So, you know, so I don't feel guilty when I do it at three o'clock the next day, you know, um, but it, it still happens and it's so reassuring and so loving. So follow those steps. Do some research. Get off your butt. You know, um, find somebody, find a medium. Mediums are great because you know, the days of the charlatans don't pull into a, 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 a you know, a, a roadside house, you know, or in, in, where it says mediums and neon, you know, look up online, you know, get referrals from friends. There's a wonderful group of parents, it's called Help Parents Helping, a parents, Helping Parents Heal, HPH. I go to his grave all the time. I mean, like a couple times a week, three times maybe. And I sit there, I have a cigar, I, I, I meditate, I listen to music, my dog's usually with me. And I feel him around and I love it. And I clean up the grave and it always looks standing tall and kids always leave little mementos and we keep those clean. And, and I, I, you know, weed whacker to make sure it's always clean. A wonderful, uh, I have a beautiful uh, statue behind, you know, of a howling coyote, you know, cause he loved the desert. So um, I go there all the time, but it's not like an old man feeding pigeons in the park, you know, for pathetic. I don't want anybody to ever feel sorry for me. I got to tell you, Louisa, I lived the life beyond my wildest dreams. And I got to be Christopher's father for 21 years on this side. And I get to join him on the other side when I cross. So the truth of the matter is, don't feel sorry for me. I feel sorry for everybody who didn't get to have Christopher in their life like I did. On a final note, is there anything you'd like to share with the Passion Harvest audience that I haven't asked you? 
Yeah, remember, they're still right here. Don't doubt it. They're still right. He must have been in front of you. <laughs> they're still right here. Your loved ones are around you. You know, do your part. It'll click. Yeah. Well, thank you so And be much. kind. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. What a thank you so thank much you. for being on Passion Harvest. I, I um, enjoyed every second, Louisa, even the crying. <laughs> yeah, me too. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. If you liked this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate inspirational interviews.